if you're on Instagram, um, I am showing slides, so you won't be able to see those slides if you are not on Facebook or YouTube. All right, so um, keep that in mind. Let me move this over. I don't want my IG folk to get knocked out. Let's make sure. Slide to share. Let the folk just filter on in. All right. Invite your family and friends on into the discussion. It's a very healthy discussion. No one's going to get disrespected because of their belief system. We are addressing the history of these particular things so that we can improve our awareness of what we're participating in, whether it be spiritual, religious, cultural, themes that we practice and so that we are empowered and not deceived. Being deceived is a very dangerous thing. All right, I think I got that right. Thank you for tuning in to Aboriginal Global Media on YouTube, on Facebook. Then you're probably on my uh, personal page, Amaru Namataga Shiali. And you're probably on Instagram, just watching in and tuning in. If you are on Instagram, you need to understand that you will not be able to see these slides. This video will be saved to our YouTube page on Aboriginal Global Media, to our Facebook page, Amaru. Namataga Shi Ali, that's A M A R U Nama N A M A A Taga T A G A Shi Ali X I hyphen A L I. And if you're on Instagram, uh, it's Skybody OG. The lecture will be saved, but it will not show the slides because I don't believe we have that feature yet available for that streaming uh, platform okay i have done three lectures on this i produced a book it's called the white men who wrote the bible the arab european and jewish theft of indigenous afro-asiatic culture and heritage this is volume one i do have another volume i'm going to release it around the time that we do our winter solstice celebration um, because it's very technical, it's about 700 pages, and I didn't want common readers to have to uh, make their way through that type of material. That material is to uh, support 
and protect me on a scholastic level so that if anyone questions uh, any particular lack of detail that I put in this book, which is about 314 pages, then they can resort to that particular writing. Um, we wanted to be efficient. We wanted to be helpful. We wanted this to be an education. We wanted to share very rare perspectives with you, uh, primary documents that you might not have ever learned of, and come to a conclusion about things so that this is not philosophical, belief-based, or an attempt to uh, market or sell something. We are only telling history as it actually went, as opposed to what you may believe. And um, in this sense, belief becomes very dangerous, all right? All right, so hopefully everyone is uh, coming to the chat. Um, we did put the book on sale for uh, the weekend, basically, and we wanted to remove anybody's claim that the book is too expensive. They're like, yo, Ali books is kind of expensive. You know, I know my worth by the pen, so I price it by what it's worth and not what, um, you know, other people might have opinions about. Uh, I'm going to share that link with you in the YouTube um, comment section. So if you're on YouTube, Aboriginal Global Media, you can go into the comments section and you'll see uh, that comment pin. Now, this, this discussion is not to disrespect any particular people. I do understand... Um, I do understand... There it is right there. All right. I do understand that religion and politics are said to be something that you should not discuss in our community. When in fact, those two are the two things that you should discuss because it will help us. It will help us because we do need uh, some level of unity amongst our people for direction and a plan because we're in a very adverse situation, all right? And we understand the economic, political, psychological ramifications, economic ramifications of that position, then you start doing problem solving. And the problem solving, um, all right, the problem solving is a mature thing to do. As men, we are celebrating Father's Day, Happy Father's Day to all of the brothers who are out there. And as a father or a husband, you understand that you are a guide, you are a protector, you are um, carrying the responsibility of keeping your family safe. And keeping your family safe from uh, adverse culture, adverse information, adverse uh, things that impact their psychology is also your duty as a father. And so, you know, I don't really, I don't just write these books for the public. I write these books for my children, you know, other wives, um, extended family members, all of that so that there's an awareness that's present so we don't have to believe. Because when we are forced to believe and rely on that belief and that belief is adverse to us, then it becomes dangerous. And it does divide us. Um, it was designed to divide us as an indigenous people. Okay. All right. So, you know, we want to make sure that we're on point and we have the library available so that we can, you know, share it with our people. So share this link because we are about to go in. A few announcements, August 18th, 19th, and 20th, we will, um, we will be here in Atlanta for our 14th annual Indigenous Summit, and the discussion is a plan for Black America, an Indigenous plan for Black America. Let's see if I can find that flyer somewhere on this page, share with you. All right, here we go. We have 
the president of our Jewel Society, Chief Ansar El Mohammed, who's also the mayor of Sun Village, an independent uh, tribal city that is in the Republic of California, uh, Southern California. And you can get more um, info and data about that by searching Sun Village. Um, they're doing awesome work there. This is the first city that we have ever owned outright since the reconstruction era. And we're looking for investment in many different areas uh, for that city. You know, it's quite uh, interesting and is also a measuring tool for you to use because this brother has and his staff have been working diligently for years and you know um we get a lot of press in the so-called black community for a lot of things and um not a lot of people who are on top want to give these brothers and sisters their press <laughs> and you know why all right we're also thankful for chief bolones out here shiamaru who is the congress president representing all of the 12 um ministerial councils and people who are elected to those positions they're doing an awesome job. They're going to help uh, put on this summit. And the chief executive, um, Sister Fatima, Sister Love, uh, Brother Shakri, um, and the other staff who helped me here, um, we are about to do it again. All right. In the ATL, you can go here and you can already purchase your tickets um, at the site. So that is available for you. And um, yeah. We want you to participate in the summit. The summit is an opportunity for us to bring our think tanks together, our intelligence amongst the so-called black community and solve the problem. We have been presenting an indigenous plan for quite some time and we're in our phase three of operations where we have the structure 100% up running all branches of, of governance. And we're, we're teaching our people how to govern themselves and bringing years and years and years of resources, education, planning, how to properly farm uh, with our type of genetics and the things that we do adversely by infusing the soil with a whole bunch of ammonia, which is conventional teaching. These are the types of things that the people on the various ministries can share with you, can teach you, can put you in training with their dissertations and other things. Uh, we have to mature as a people. And part of the reason we don't stay mature is we keep seeping back into this stuff. And when we seep back into this stuff, it does make us immature in the sense of community. You can go amongst other communities and you can see them making progress in a lot of areas. And many of them, even though they are following certain things, they understand how to distinguish those things. All right. So um, we're about to go in. And as we go in, no one understand this is not an attack upon Hebrews or Jews or uh, Arab Muslims, um, European scholars, King James, not an attack on any of that. But we have to tell the truth. So we're going to start this out with three concepts. The first is a concept called pseudographia. Pseudographia is when you think that somebody wrote something and they actually didn't write it, but their name is a pseudoname for a hidden author of that particular thing. A good example of pseudographia is believing that Moses, a person named Moses a few thousand years ago, wrote something called the Pentateuch or the Torah. Those are the first five books of the Bible. Okay. Um, there was never a person named Moses who wrote that material. That is an absolute lie if you believe that. In fact, the person that you know of as Moses is a character stolen from other people who used that particular name before that character ever even existed in the minds of its authors. That's important. 
So the Moses that you know of in the Bible never existed. But there are Moseses in history who did exist, who uh, had their lives taken from them as far as the material, and that material was used to foment a character. But that character did not give us any Pentateuch or any Torah at all. That is a fact of history. Now, in belief, you can make up anything that you want. The two fairy exists in belief. Santa Claus exists in belief. And a Moses who wrote a Torah exists in belief, but not in reality. And when you subscribe to a, an illusion over reality, then you're playing a very dangerous game with your brain cells and your neurotransmission and your ability to perceive the world properly in a healthy way. Okay. Um, next, we have historical displacement. So we have pseudographia, historical displacement. And uh, I'm going to go for my notes today, which I rarely do. Uh, retroacting. So historical displacement, Israel is a, is, a, is a perfect example of this. There was no prophet named Yaqub or Jacob who wrestled with an angel or with God and got the name Israel. By the time that was written down, the name Israel had already existed and it had nothing to do with that story. So those people who wrote that story stole something from some people out of context, brought it to another context and claimed it as their own. In today's world, that would be copyright infringement. That's like me taking a Nas song and, and labeling it, it was written and taking some of his lyrics out of the song and then publishing it and I get paid for Nas's gifts, Nas's uh, uh, proprietary material. Israel belonged to another people and it had nothing to do with Jewish, Judaism, Hebrews or anything. They didn't even know what that was when they were writing the word down. I'm about to show you that, okay? And lastly, retroacting. Retroacting is a very crafty thing done in history. And the retroacting that is important here, a good example would be in the history of Islam, which has a lot to do with the production of the Bible. You have a group of people who are called the Abbasids. And allegedly, uh, they're called Abbasids because one of these people was the uncle of Prophet Muhammad. That is a lie. They're called Abbasids because of their first leader. And they were not Muslims. They were Christians. Primary documents prove that. As a matter of fact, they were the second Rome to develop because the first Rome was a lie. The second Rome in Constantinople is the real first Rome. And then you have the enunciation of the, the Byzantine Empire through Arabs. At a time where in the papyri, 750 AD, the Quran tells you, say not three, but Allah is one. And the Abbasids are enunciating the trinity of the Byzantine Empire. So there was no Abbas who was the uncle of Muhammad. There was no Muhammad as you have been given it. And the people who are saying that they are Muslim now retroacted themselves to be Muslim when they were Rome, Byzantium. So history is not what you believe it to be, it's what it is. It's what it is, right? And so that's important. Now, there's always people in the chat who are saying things. He said, this is not Abo attire. I got tattoos all over my body that are temple art. So when you see, again, retroacting, you can have Fendi and other groups of people who steal indigenous art and they put it on things and you start thinking that that's their attire. So I'm going to uh, relieve you of your duty and get you up out of here. Yeah. That's important. So that you don't disturb the conversation. 
because I do monitor my chat now, right? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not going to stop people from having an opinion, but I am going to stop you from disturbing our focus. And so we have pseudographia, we have uh, historical displacement, and we have retroacting. Those are the three tools that are used by European, Arab, Jewish uh, historians uh, in order to take and steal indigenous history that happened on this planet, take it as their own and represent it to the world and tell you you're going to go to hell. You're not saved. You're uh, going to miss the Messiah. You're going to miss all these things because of our lie. Now, there are millions of indigenous people, billions of them on the earth who believe that whose potential is being their energy, which is real. Their potential is being uh, destroyed and we don't get to get their contribution because they don't know this. And now for $30, you can know all of this, which is going to change the planet. When all of that energy is not directed towards them and is directed to back towards our families, our community, our thoughts, our ability to govern indigenously all over the planet, that is a different world. But if you are hung up on spookisms and beliefs that are stealing your energy away from your family, yourself, your own development, that is a hex of a different type of character. Right. And so this is important to humanity because there are people who are coming before you who are not even fully human, who are talking about what humanity needs. And that is not a makeup belief. That is science to its core. And we can take you beyond this core. We'll just use what they reference since you like to use references. They're not even fully human and trying to guide you. Homo sapien human. All right. So let's start this out. Because we're here now. And there's no need to waste any of your time. Let's go to our share so we can eat through this entire conversation. The book link is in the chat. The book is $30 till 12 o'clock tonight. I left it there the whole weekend. We promoted it. I don't want to hear the excuse you don't know this information. Because in the cell structure of the human body, the ion channels communicate to the cells in groups so that they can keep their diversity they can keep the same wavelength communication. They talk to each other. And when cells detach from that communication network, they go cancerous. So if you detach from the upgrades of the information, that is strictly your choice. That's not my fault. We're leading the sharing of the information so that you can win. Share it in there one more time before we jump. If you want the hard copy, you can get the hard copy. You, know, you can get it all in color, however you want to get it. But here we go. There is the link. It's in the chat. By 12 o'clock, I don't want to hear, man, why y'all ain't extending the sale? We did. Now you can read slowly through and use these videos in order to help you. Let's go. Let's go. We're going to start out with the Josephus Paul.
comparison to show the pseudographia. This is on page eight. All right. This is how pseudographia takes place. You have a person who's called Paul in the New Testament. Paul never existed. But allegedly he was supposed to have existed in the Levant, Middle East, during the first century AD. We tracked him through 33 cities and 33 interactions with people. That interaction matched this person of history who's supposed to be one of the most important Jewish historians, Flavius Josephus. Flavius Josephus met the same 33 people in the same 33 cities, and we pointed that out in the appendix. We even give the statements from the works of Flavius Joseph as opposed to the epistles of Paul to show that somebody in history wrote them in as the same fake character. One in history, one in religion. They never existed. Then we found out who the real Flaviuses were in the Flavian dynasty. There was no Flavian dynasty in ancient Rome. Because that Rome never existed. It was retroacted into history. There were no Flavians. And we have exactly what historians wrote these people in. We, we put very great detail into this. So this is the perfect example of pseudographia. Anybody who's quoting Paul is quoting a medieval hidden scholar who we have now revealed who they were. They had no idea that Paul didn't exist. And when we come to the end of this, they had no idea that Jesus never existed. One of the most allegedly important persons we we showed you in detail, step for step, how he was developed. Then how he was retroacted in, in that particular calendar to that time, when it happened. So this is the most shaking information that you're going to discuss. So we put, we charted it in great detail for you. Then we went straight to the Ebla tablets and the Ebla archives. Because Ebla, which was a vassal state of Kemet, when you see the Nara palette, there is a chronology on there and there's history. That war that they were having was with Ebla, which was another black civilization in the Levant. Ebla became a vassal state of uh, Tameri, which you know of as Egypt. But here we're showing you from our initial lecture because Israel was mentioned 18 times at the Ebla archives website. They took it down and reorganized the entire system of how they presented this since we did we put this information out. And this is about back six years ago. That wasn't when we found it. That was when we started putting it out. Israel was an epithet to the god El, which meant to protect El. The followers were El, of El were not Hebrews and not Jews because they didn't exist during that time period. These were black people in the Levant who practiced uh, systems that were ancient to, and indigenous to that area. It was material culture. They had statues of these entities. El, Il, Ila, however you want to use the pronunciation for the vocalization for it. Eblite, Canaanite, all of these languages were indigenous to those people. There were no Jews. So we mentioned that 18 times that Ebla has the word Israel. We showed you the black god Il or El. We even showed you the character who Abram or Abraham was written from. He was written from a character in Ebla. Ibrium. And in the Kara, that's how you say it. Ibrium. Not Abraham. Abraham is an English transliteration of Ibrium. So we made some linguistic comparisons, but we just wanted to highlight the fact that Israel belonged 
to another people. It had nothing to do with Jews, nothing to do with Hebrews, nothing to do with what was put in the Bible about a prophet named Jacob. It was 100% factually stolen. That's what needs to be. That's what needs to be highlighted. The Bible is not from God. It's not from the spiritual plane. It's not from, it is from white men. And that's okay because they wrote their history for themselves. But now they have indigenous people following their history. The, the book is okay for them. They wrote a bunch of mythology for them. You had your own customary culturally designed system. Some of them were not very good and some of them were very good. That's the part you need to understand just because it's ancestral doesn't mean it's good. Doesn't mean it's efficient. Doesn't mean it's functional. You have some very great things and some very bad things. They made you a very great people and a very bad people or dis dysfunctional. Let's say that. So we're just highlighting this and then we go straight to the tablets to highlight those same things. Where does the word Adam come from? Where does the word Malik come from? Where does the word uh, Dean come from? These are words that have etymology. So when you say Maliki on Medin, you need to know the etymology of what that actually comes from so that you will be able to get a clearer perspective on the, the uh, genetic linguistics. But for a fact, here it is. This is Ebla showing the Ankh. They were a vassal state in and out of becoming a vassal state to Kemet. All right. That's important. Now, let me go to page 227 really quick because I want to show you how they tried to insert Israel into history and the tricks that they used to do so. So that was one trick. Here's another trick. Let's go to page 227. Here is another trick. I'll read this directly from the page so you can get it. So you can see how they retroact, use pseudographia, and use historical displacement. The Jews have attempted to create a language called Hebrew that never existed in antiquity. Hebrew is a bastard child of Greek, and Greek is a bastard child of Punic. There was never any original Hebrew Bible. It's never been found. The first mention of a name close to Jew is in the Nimrud tablet K3751. The archaeological reference to Judah is Yaudea. This mention has nothing to do with Jews, Hebrews, and there was no mention of a Bible during this time. The name Ia or Yah shows an Egyptian Eblaite linguistic connection. Ia, or like you say, Amos, or Iashu, which was a cognate of one of the pharaohs. Ea is shown with a crescent disc with a solar uh, picture, and it represents the conjunction between the sun and the moon. It represents an eclipse. And even if you say it just represents the setting sun or whatever you want to try to interpret that as, when you see that prefix, that is comedic language. Translated down into interacting with people in the Levant, Canaanites, and Eblites, and all these different people. All right. So let's keep going. This group was said to reside in sandy plains and valleys. Let's go down further because we got to go to the Kirkin monoliths. That's where we're at, right here. The Kirkin monoliths were. The only other uh, monuments that are said to mention Jews by mentioning Israel, according to some scholars and the mayor Protostele. The identification of, quote, 10,000 soldiers of Ahabu Syria. 
They tried to translate it as Israel. No. Sir or Sir or Sar was a prince. And Ilya is the ancient name for Jerusalem. So in this uh, Kirk monolith, you have uh, a recording of the invasion of the Assyrians. And they're talking about Ahab, the prince of Jerusalem. Now, how do we know that Ilya was called Ilya and it meant Jerusalem? Because the early Muslims call Jerusalem Ilya. It was allegedly supposed to be from a leader of Rome. But this text, which is up in the BCs, 8th and 9th century BC, existed before there was an alien or alias who was the leader of the fake retroactive Rome. You follow me? So now you can prove through linguistics that Jerusalem was called Ilya, that when the Muslims were using it, they were using it as an ancient name that had already been uh, used all the way back to the time of Egypt for Jerusalem, and that there was never any Roman who caused Jerusalem to be named Ilya, ever. It's an indigenous name. So this is another text where they're trying to say it's Israel and it's not even Israel. It's, it's an it's a accounting of the conquering of Assyrians in that particular land. All right. So let's go to, let's go back to the Abbasids because I want to show you that the Abbasids were probably the best retro actors of all time. Yeah, they did it. They did it at another level. So we're going to go to page 24. And here you have a coin. Abu al-Abbas was the first ruler of the Abbasid dynasty. That's how you get the word Abbasid or Abbas. It wasn't from no uncle, from, from Prophet Muhammad. And here's a coin in the name of that ruler who was a vassal of Byzantium prior to this time. Some 14th century depictions of him. But let's go to the actual papyrus. Because in this papyrus from 750 AD, which is the transition of rule from the black Umayyah, the black Muslims, the Saracens, that group who initiated Islam in Egypt and not even in Mecca. We are rearranging your whole concept of geography based on primary documents, not based on Arabized history. Because in Arabized history, in 750 AD, the Abbasids were already Muslim. Now I'm showing you here, right here, primary documentation where they were Christians worshiping the Trinity. They had not even converted to Islam. The only reason they converted to Islam was to overthrow the indigenous Egyptian movements that overthrew the, the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanian Empire. That's the only reason that they did that. And here you have the Pagar who is calling himself Flavius, Josephus. Flavius Josephus was supposed to have lived over eight centuries earlier. When in fact, these documents predate all of Flavius Josephus' works, which came later. Yeah, you're going to have to readjust your history. So the, the Abbasids were not named after no uncle from Prophet Muhammad. That Muhammad that they present to you never lived. Never lived. That Muhammad. There was a Muhammad. That one did never live. This is over a hundred some odd years after him and the Abbasids are still Christian, worshiping the Trinity. When in, in their history, they tried to sell us they was already Muslims. Yeah. So y'all gonna have to deal with that.
Do I want to touch on this Constantine history now from 205? Let's see. Let me check this. I'll do it. All right. So now, so let's get a picture of the beginning of Christianity in Rome. This is Constantine's symbol I'm showing here. You know how they tell you the history Constantine had a dream and he saw the cross and he was protecting the Christians. First of all, in 300 AD, there were no Christians. <laughs> there were no Christians. There was Rome, the first one. Not the fake when they try to retroact into BC era, which never existed. This was Rome. And this symbol had nothing to do with a cross. The symbol is the symbol of the archon or the ruler. And the lettering in the Greek alphabet is for R and uh, Chi. Archon. Ruler. Constantine did not show no cross. He had the symbol for a Greco-Roman ruler, Archon. And later, the same uh, symbol became the symbol for Kyrios because it has the Chi and the R, Kyr. So I'll read exactly what I have here. Here we have the sign or flag, Istos. Istos. The Istos was the emblem of, this, of the flag. Christos. The ruler, the ruler's symbol. Christos meant the Greco-Romans ruling flag or emblem. Had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with a Christ. <laughs> nothing at all. That came later. This is not a Christian cross. Constantine never saw no Christian cross. He never had no dreams about it. They were never, it, there's nothing in the literature. He came after Diocletian and the Tetrarchy, which founded Rome. And they used the Diocletian calendar. There was no AD calendar. They started from the rule of Diocletian and they did the tax, uh, 15 year tax cycle. That's the calendar they went by. There was no AD and BC calendar at this time. There was no talking about Jesus. There was nothing. It is not a Christian cross. It is a Greek and Latin set of signs for a ruler. The Greek word archon has the letters R, shaped like that P that you see, and CH, shaped like an X. She. <laughs> yeah, this gets deep. The word allegedly meaning Christos in Greek is actually a flag sign of the ruler or emperor and not Christ. This was injected later as a meaning. The X became associated with Christ it sounds is she. The R represented a leader and the she a jurisdiction of that leader. So when you take the Greek back to its original Punic, the R is the head of a man and the she is a fence or a gate. It represents the jurisdiction of an emperor or a ruler. It had nothing to do with Christ. Nothing to do with Christians. Nothing to do with anything to do with anything to do with anything. And that is a problem. A big one. So let's fast forward a little bit. And go to our Barmakid family who were the scholars of the Abbasids. We're going to go to page 28, 29. All right. So you see it say, see the Abbasids were worshiping uh, the Trinity. 
And here you have it in the Quran, Surah 4, verse 171. And do not say three. Stop it. It is better for you. Certainly Allah is one. How would they, how would they even be Muslims and they are worshiping the Trinity? And the Quran they were supposed to have already and be disseminating was telling them, say not three. <laughs> this also shows you the development of the Quran. The Quran wasn't written by one person over a 23-year period. Of, no, it was much longer than that. And I covered some of that. We, we can also talk about the tampering with that book. All right. So this next part shows you where the Kaaba got its building structure from. So the Barma kids who were helping the Abbasids, they were Buddhists. The founding family of Abbasid scholarship were Buddhists. Let me read. The Abbasids first major alliance politically was with the Barma kid family from Balkh in what is now Afghanistan. The Barma kids were the major source of creating the modern religious concepts in the Arabized Islam and in Christianity. Khalid, son of Barmak, was the vizier of Abu al-Abbas, the founder of the dynasty. Khalid's son, Yahya, was the main vizier of Harun al-Rashid, the father of al-Makmun. The Barmakids descended from the chiefs or administrators of the Buddhist monastery called Nava Vihara, the new monastery. This is why you find Christians in monasteries in their inception and practicing celibacy. They were getting it from these Buddhist teachers. New perspective. Here is an example of how these Buddhists impacted culture. Mecca is not mentioned in the Quran and it is, was only a holy city uh, for the founders of, uh, it was not a holy city for the founders of Islam. Mecca was not the holy city, all right? After the Barma kids, Mecca became a center and a holy city, yet it was literally designed after the Nabahar, Nava Vihara, new monastery of these Buddhists. And Arab author Umar ibn al Azraq al Karmani wrote a detailed account of Nava Vihara at the beginning of the 8th century. This is important. 700s now we're dealing with. That is preserved in a later 10th century work, the Kitab al Buldan by Ibn al Faqi. He described Nava Vihara in terms strikingly similar to the Kaaba in Mecca, the holiest site of Islam. He described that the main temple had a stone cube in the center, draped with cloth, and that devotees circambulated it and made prostration, as is the case with the Kaaba. The stone cube referred to the platform on which a stupa stood and was the custom in Bactrian temples. The cloth that draped it was in accordance with the Persian custom of showing veneration that applied equally to Buddha statues as well as stupas. Now, this is where years ago people were trying to say that Islam comes from the Catholic Church. No, 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 no. Because they didn't know the origin. And they were associating the origin with the Abbasids. They missed the whole history of the foundation of the movement in the Thebaid in Egypt. And that is important because many of your great scholars who you hold high, like uh, Reverend Phil Valentine and others, who are not good historians, were perpetuating this information. And it was uh, dysfunctional because it was not accurate. All right. And you got to get the story right. So here you have it. In the Bible, Jericho is allegedly circambulated seven times before the walls fall. That story was written later. Jericho as a city was named after the lunar deity Yarik, which was in Ebla. The records of Ebla were stored all over the Levant and scholars at the Abbasid court used what they stole from the Umayya and gained by colonization to begin to craft their story and it's written all over their text, the Bible.
So we have Jews, Christians, Freemasons, and others using circambulation. What is its origins? We find this practice amongst Buddhists first, then spreading to other religions. And how it got into Islam was through the Barmakids. Now, this is an ancient practice. Nothing wrong with the practice because it represents something celestially. But knowing its origins is very important. Let us examine further amongst the Abbasids and how all the Bibles commence in this period. Jews have no ancient copies of the Bible, Tanakh or Torah, Pentateuch. Their oldest copies come during the Abbasid control of the Levant. Here is a map of the production of Hebrew Bibles. The oldest comes in the 10th to 11th century AD. That's not even a thousand years ago. The oldest Bible is not even a thousand years old. Not even. Believe what you want. We can prove our points. Let's go on this Buddhist point, though. This is why I'm going to show you. Let's go to page 253. This is why Jesus has the profile that he has. The Barma kids were the white family who were helping shape. All right. The concept of Jesus being missing for the first 12 years of his life also relates to Buddhism, the 12 links of dependent origination or the Pratitya, what's that? Samupada. When one link exists, the link following arises as an effect of the preceding link, such as craving giving rise to grasping or birth giving rise to old age and death. Another reference to 12 is the 12 psychic powers possessed by a Buddha, clairvoyance, etc. All right. Jesus is supposed to be crucified at 33. The number of deities in the Vedic religion is 33. The second level of heaven in Buddhism is named Triastrimsa, meaning of the 33 gods. Celibacy. A monk, these were written into a character by a group of people, and it was the Barmakids. We know for a fact that that's where the origination of the typing of the character. But let's jump on because we got to touch on some of this. You say the Bible was written for by white men, prove it. Let's go. Prophets of the Bible and progenitor of them, Adam, are all described as white men in the Bible. The word used in ancient times was the equivalent of red or ruddy as we use it today. We have already pointed out that the Egyptian Atum and the Quran Adam were described and pictured as black. Hama. Who made the prophets of the Bible into white men? Its authors did because they were white men. I will use the King James versions of the international and the international standard. First Samuel 16, 11 through 13. And Samuel said unto Jesse, are here all of thy children? And he said, there remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all a beautiful countenance. What word is used there in the Hebrew and the Greek? We're going to see. And goodly to look at. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Ruddy, ruddy, ruddy. You see it all here. What is this ruddiness? Red, red skinned. Samuels chapter 5, verse 10. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among 10,000. This is talking about uh, Solomon. Now, Hebrews will be on the side of the corner and say, read 1 Samuels uh, verse 5. Solomon was black. <laughs> no, that's not what it says, actually. My great Hebrew friends, 
let's read over and slow down so that we don't get tricked. Because first Solomon, verse five, is actually Solomon's wife apologizing for being Sahur. Sahur is black, feminine, skin. You never see Sahur for a prophet in the Bible. This is his wife apologizing. Let's go read. Like they say, read. Song of Solomon, first chapter four through six. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king have brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright love thee. I am black, but beautiful or but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon. Look not upon. Now here she is apologizing for being black, for being Sahur. Look not upon me because I am black, because the sun have looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard have I not kept. So she is excusing herself for being black, blaming the sun and being out in the hot sun in the vineyards. That's not Solomon. That's his wife apologizing for being black. Who wrote this into the text? Who wrote this? Hebrews? Because that ain't Solomon. Solomon is red. Unless we're going to get to what red is. Here we have the word sahur. All right. As we can see, the adjective is feminine. Because it's talking about a woman. And singular. And discussing her skin. Solomon never was called Sahur anywhere in the Bible. Neither was David, Adam, or any of the other prophets. The writers of the Bible were white men who were racist. They hated black and infused their hate into the messages, while at the same time stealing the black people's culture, God's names, Israel, El, to foment their book, which you are following right now to your own indigenous detriment. Our grandmothers followed this book. Our great-grandmothers followed this book. And we told you why we were converting to Christianity. We were converting to Christianity because what? The, the laws in Virginia and other places said you couldn't enslave a Christian. It was a political, uh, we didn't believe in that shit. Then they started saying, y'all can't be Christian. You see how this works? And the real secret is the reason why they outlawed Christian subjects and slaves is because Christians were huge slaves to Arabs. The white slave trade is an unknown discussion. We've been talking about it for years and years. Now it's becoming popular again to talk about it. So we have this too in the Bible. Definitely some pedophilia. We can go into that. 40-year-old men marrying 10-year-old women. And you might say, oh, well, back then, when a woman went through menses, that's when she became a woman. Two points on that. Your women are going through menses too early. And that is a result of genetic modification. We shouldn't have been drinking no cow's milk for no Arabs and no Jews and Hebrews and the aromatase in it is making the age of uh, puberty drop. And it's because of accelerated aging that is taking place as the cells lose their memory of their diversity. Oh, we can go all the way in on this subject. A woman should be well into her teens before she has her, before she has her first menses. And second of all, even if she is 15 or 16, what the hell are you 40 years old looking at a 15 year old? At any time in history, that woman hasn't went through no rites of passage. She hasn't went through no training, no development. And it's on the duty of the men to set up the protections for that. Oh, yeah. See, Instagram taking me off. I'm going to go back on, y'all. Hold on.
I'm going back on. Let me get Instagram back on real quick. They ain't about to cut me off. Hold on. I'm going to bring y'all back. I'm going to bring y'all back. I ain't going to even let them do it to me tonight. It's not happening. So, yeah. Second thing is the woman is not even uh, mature enough. It goes to show who wrote the book. And I don't care if there were indigenous civilizations who practiced this. We have to upgrade our uh, ability to perceive properly in real time. That's important. Super important. So the prophets were white. Matter of fact, let's go to Appendix B so we can end this discussion. Because we ain't about to let y'all get away. Because y'all saying King James is black. Y'all saying a whole bunch of stuff. But we know why y'all saying it. Let's go. Black Hebrews. We have to dismantle this. They say in Jeremiah book 14 verses 1 through 5. It says the Jews were black. Uh, no, it does not actually. They also claim that the book of Jeremiah calls the Jews black. This is absolutely false. This verse is calling the gates black in the context are curses upon Judah. Here it is. Jeremiah 14, one through five. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah concerning the dearth. Judah mourneth and the gates, the gates thereof languish. The gates of Judah. They, the gates are black unto the ground. And the cry of Jerusalem is gone up and their nobles have sent their little ones to the waters. They came to the pits and found no water. They returned with their vessels empty. They were ashamed and confounded and covered their heads. So this is about curses upon them. And the word that's used for black here is Kadar, not Sahor for skin, Kadar. And what does Kadar mean? To mourn, dark. Darken, darkening in thought. That's the context is used. To mourn, to be dark, to cause to mourn. Kadar, a primitive root, to be ashy. <laughs> to be ashy. Are you kidding me? They're calling y'all ashy gates that got burnt down. And y'all trying to say that that's, y'all got to stop this, man. I got all of it here. Y'all can see what I'm showing. These people will even say Noah had three sons. Ham and Shem were two of them. And Ham and Shem are brothers, which means they have the same haplogroup, genetic haplogroup. I don't care if you say you don't believe in genetics. I do genetic testing. I can see this stuff. They have the same haplogroup. If they brothers. Now the mitochondrial line coming down the women, we're not even discussing the women. We're talking about the genetic haplogroup. Then they say they're not related to the Africans, but they got the same common ancestor. First of all, Shem and, and, and Ham never existed. Y'all do know that, right? Shem and Ham never existed. There was no Noah on a boat. Because in Arabic you say new. In Hebrew, you say nuok or nu, depending on what strain of Hebrew you're using. <laughs> Y'all want to know where the, where the ark comes from? Where did they steal the story of the ark come from? With somebody named Noah or nu. Right here. Right here. It's right here. The book of Gates. You have nu with eight ancestors. And two women holding up Kepara, receiving the sun disc from the other uh, from the underworld. That's Noah's Ark. So when the Abbasids invaded Egypt, they started taking these stories with the Barma kids. Now you got Noah's Ark, <laughs> which is News Ark, which is the Book of Gates from Kemet.
Y'all do need to know that this is how these stories got stolen from indigenous peoples. Y'all do need to know that. Y'all need to know that. Adam, Eve, and the serpent? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Y'all want to see Adam at whom? With the serpent? Y'all know where these stories come from? Stop it. Stop it. This is Adam and the serpent, where it came from. I pet. We can go so, 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 so far with this. And we're going to keep going. Let's go to Hebrew. Because y'all saying Hebrew, the Bible is written in Hebrew, and Hebrew is God's original language. And y'all saying all this stuff and all this stuff and all this stuff. And uh, Hebrew is Greek. Hebrew is Greek. And Greek is stolen Punic from Phoenicia or the Punic civilizations. So y'all don't even have no language. All right, let's go to Joseph Yehuda. Page 230, 231. We're going to go to him. Let's go, Joseph. Hebrew is Greek. This is the book. I think we have this on our website. You can purchase it or get access to it. The physical copies are very, very expensive. Let's read what Joseph Yehuda had to say about Greek. This is a lot. The entire premise of the work of Yehuda is to present thousands of homologues, that should say, in Greek and Hebrew. A homologue is defined as words that have similar structure, meaning, and grammar state. Yehuda showed that, the, that biblical words in Greek match Hebrew words in the Bible. Yehuda took a 30-year study to finish his 680-page work. Hebrew is Greek. The foreword of the book is by Professor Saul Levin of the Ancient Languages of the University of New York. It's in his foreword, Dr. Levin states that in Yehuda's book, there is overwhelming evidence which proves that Hebrew actually, it, biblic, biblical Hebrew is camouflage Greek. He goes on to say, that their difference is merely found in the pronunciation of some of the words in the language. From the mouth of Yehuda, he says, I was somewhat familiar with the Bible, as stated above. My brother Solomon and I learned the New Testament in Hebrew translation from a copy that my father had as a part of his personal library. For years, the distant biblical past was alive in my mind. I lived with the vision of the pyramids to such an extent and my passion for the Bible was so great that I developed hostile feelings for the Greeks and Romans. Strangely, this hostility did not involve the Egyptians, who were our enemies, had been the enemies of our forefathers, and had so deeply influenced post-biblical Hebrew. Neither had I been able to learn more than the necessary Latin needed for my law education and practice. However, my feelings for the Greeks and Romans have changed radically since then. Now I realize that our differences were similar to those of a civil war, infighting, because we are Greeks and Romans. <laughs> as fratricidal as the taking of Troy had been, for I became convinced that the Jews are of Greek descent. By studying their language. From the beginning, I based a lot of my work on Arabic. With my theory, it became possible for me to correct the translation of the Septuagint using the Septuagint and the translation of the Bible using the Bible. These discoveries cured me of my dyslexia in relationship to Greek and Hebrew and made me capable of reading a Hebrew word as if it had been a variation of the word in Greek. I formed a series of phonetic and morphology rules. I gradually gathered a number of valuable facts. Some examples are that the, the, the uh, declension, all right, the dative exists in Hebrew, that the masculine plural is the same in Hebrew and Greek, and that in general, a compound Greek word is equivalent to a Hebrew compound verb. I estimate that nine out of each 10 words of the Jewish Bible can be proved 
a purely Greek equivalent. Many issues were resolved, which proved that the Greeks and Jews have some customs and religious convictions in common, whereas the Hebrew language is proven to be richer and more beautiful than believed until today because of the existence of these groups of words. This whole matter is in practice consistent with the following two proposals. Biblical Hebrew is Greek and the Jews are Asian Greeks. In reality, the conclusion of this massive, extended, and complicated research can be summarized in the following brief sentence. Hebrew is Greek wearing a mask. You need to get that book and go study. You'll be studying for a long time. And what you're going to find out is what he said. Biblical Hebrew is Greek. And Greek is invented from this Punic. Stolen property return forever. Hebrew Israelites, y'all can all line up. I bring you back here to your indigenous mind. Hopefully you study and you love the truth. Your teachers don't know or do know and are lying to you. Every one of you. Oh, we just getting started. We just getting started. Let's go to the chronology. Page 237 to 242. So if we're not going to follow the calendars and the chronology, where is ours? I told you that the beginning of the Bible and the beginning of the Quran, where it's talking about the six days, is not six days that creation was made. This is a discussion that the ancient authors knew, and it dealt with the repair of the atmosphere after a cataclysm. A time period where in several places the sun would not even shine on the earth. And this is how you got original people to devolve down into hominids. That wasn't evolution that was devolving. And we can find it through the S&P networks and the diseases that developed in hominids. We're rewriting the library. It's happening right now. It's not going to happen. It's happening. And when they devolve down to these hominids, Neanderthals, Denisovans, Australopithecus afarensis, etc. They went extinct. Extinction is the period on the de decline by disease. Biological decline. Those hominids don't exist anymore. Go ask the anthropologists what were they doing that caused their decline? Into extinction. You can't be biologically healthy into extinction. Then we did experiments of admixture with them to try to bring some of them back. And we did. And they are humanoid today. This is genetic science. This is not feelings. This is not I'm mixed. And I have a problem with you, Ali, because of that, 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 that. I'm not putting you down as a person. I am telling you what happened to human beings on this earth. And guess what? We can fix it. That's the secret. We should be fixing the genetic abnormalities that came by cataclysm. And they are evident in us and how we phenotypically look today. So for thousands of years, you have hated on this dark skin and this kinky black hair when it is genetically superior for this realm. That has nothing to do with your feelings. I did not say I am intellectually superior to you. I said that we can chart the dis-ease. 
through S&P networks and the admixture. Europeans, Neanderthals mix with Homo sapiens. Y'all mix with some of our ancestors to save y'all people. This is important for you to understand. How you came about is not God sprinkled everybody on the earth. He put the Asians over there, the Europeans in Europe, the Africans in Africa, Native Americans. And that is not what happened. So when you go from where I'm at right now, I think I'm on page 237, 238. And you look at these stories in these books, you are looking at refurbishing earth after a cataclysm. You are not looking at the beginning of man and woman. And when you read these verses, you need to understand what they are because now you have an indigenous chronology. Why do you think that the Narma palette has Narma up here with the mace head holding them by the forelock? Why do you find the same thing in Mexico? What is this about? It's giving you astro chronology. I'm going to use the first book, the Umil Kitab, before there was a Bible, before there was a Quran, before there was a Pert Imheru, Book of Coming Forth by Day, before there was Vedas, before you had nature as your book and you are illiterate. If you can't read nature, you are, that's the functional illiteracy that's happened. Because if you could, you could never be deceived by what people write in books. You can't be deceived by it. You cannot be deceived by it. Orion is the celestial equator, the zero mark for charting. These people are telling you on the Narma pilot that they knew longitude, latitude, the celestial meridian, the terrestrial meridian. And they're chronicling history. So now we go back to this concept because I didn't do this, but I needed you to understand that in ancient times they call white people red. Deshretu. Here it is. So when they're calling themselves ruddy and red, they're using the ancient name that we use for white people. Let's go to this chronology. Two thirty-seven to two forty-two. That's where I'm at. Excuse me. All right, here we go. So we're twelve thousand years in from that cataclysm. We wrote about it all over the earth. We went to Stone Mountain. We go to Kennesaw Mountain. We go to Arabia Mountain here. Kennesaw Mountain, Arabia Mountain, and Stone Mountain are not rocks from the inside of the earth. They are rocks from outer space. They are meteors. And we have exactly when those meteors crashed. They were part of a larger meteor that made the Gulf of Mexico. And yes, we did have animals that were similar to large reptiles here under the name dinosaurs. They went extinct through hunting and through cataclysms. The earth has lost some of its heat. Those animals require a certain amount of heat in order to exist. They are no longer here. We wrote about them. Literally wrote about them. And so this 6,000 years was 6,000 years of refurbishing the Earth's environment to make it palatable to live. And then you see agriculture start coming and other things, which were the output of we have to now grow our food because the wild 
huge fruits and vegetables that we used to have here prior to this cataclysm don't even grow like that anymore. We're just getting back to a point where we're going to start learning how to do those things. If some type of cataclysm happened right now, most of you don't even know how to make a hammer. If you lose your hammers, you would have no tools. You'll be back into primitive age and having people think you evolved from some type of primitive being. No, we had way, way, way higher and more advanced civilizations than we have right now on this earth. And we're starting to see it through the interaction of UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomenon, unidentified flying objects, aliens, all this stuff. It's breaking your Bible, your biblical mind. Because <laughs> in the Bible, you just had the creation of man and woman. You didn't have people on other planets. Now you find out you have people on other planets. This is all prehistory. The history that you're in the vacuum in is the Judeo-Christian Arabized histories. Indigenous people been knew it was people on other planets and other things going on. They got you believing in something that is not real, a false time. It's 2023. It's 2023. I'm just getting you to know who wrote the New Testament, the Old Testament. Like I'm just we just getting you to know that stuff. You just figuring that out. Let me go back. 180. I think it's on page 180. Let's go. Y'all don't even know who wrote these books. Y'all about to find out. Who wrote these books? 151, actually. Excuse me. Who wrote these books? Look. Look at this. Look at this. The subsequent rise of the Saracens in the seventh century put a halt to their work. The first Rome. It took the Abbasid's invasion of the Umayyah, the Saracens, to bring the second Rome after its fall by the hands of Islam. Saracens, Moors, Umayyah, Black Muslims, whatever term you want to use. In that time, the Diatessaron and the Peshitta were written into Arabic by Arab Abbasid Christians, notably Abu Faraj al Tayyib. He gained access to Syriac documents held by the Abbasid court and translated and added to the Diatessaron and the Peshitta. This is an Arab writing those books. Look at it. Who wrote the Pentateuch? Y'all talk about Moses. Moses was stole from Kamos, Amos, and Thutmose. All who had the name before him. Then you have the Leningrad Codex, which is the oldest Masoretic text on earth is not even a thousand years old. These Bibles ain't old. What's old is your thought that you understand time. It's 2023 right now? Let's test that. Let's test that. Let's test it. I put the people in who, who, who made you believe that it's 2023. I'm going to show you now. Just show you. Let me show you. Let me show you. Let me show you an idea of how this works. Got to go to page 180. All right. Here we go. Here we see a date that today would be recognized as 1524 A.D. The real date is the era of Jesus, 524. So the time that we think is 1500s was the era of Jesus, 500 something. Where did this calendar first come from? See the AD and BC calendar that they gave you. Pope Gregory was doing all of this and Dionysus did this and tried to do that. No, it took me years to figure this out. Now I got the primary documentation. 
The era of Jesus started from the schism of the Greek Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church in the West. That's when the Anno Domini calendar start, which is uh, uh, under a thousand years ago, less than a thousand years ago. They had an era of Jesus, which shows you before then, nobody believed prior to about 1053 AD on our calendar now, nobody believed that there was a Jesus that was a thousand years old. Nobody believed that. The Greek Orthodox's Jesus was not the same as the Catholic Church's Jesus. They, they changed it. They were changing it. First, he was a mythical thing. Who would ask you when was Osiris born? When was Osiris born? Nobody thinks about that because everybody understands that Osiris is a mythical character that represents the attributes of the Neb or the Pharaoh. Now, if he was a historical personage, we have no idea what calendar, what time, when. We don't know. He was not given a birthday. Jesus was the same way, or Eosus, or prior to that, Serapis. He wasn't given no birth date. Everybody knew he was a mythical creature of some sort. Eosus was known until this time period, less than a thousand years ago. Now they start retroacting a real character into history. So let's read this. Here we see the date that is allegedly to be 1524 by modern European Scaligerite chronologists. The date is actually started with an I. This is before the J became in use. The I represents Isis, Iosis. This is before the universal switch across Europe of the I for the use of J, which came uh, later in that same year. They started doing it. It was a French guy who started it. The date is actually 527 years from the schism of the Catholic Church and the establishment of their type of Jesus figure. This figure did not exist in Eastern Byzantine Greek Orthodox Church. It was a new retroactive figure. Their figure was a myth. Their figure in the other church was a mythical savior, Jesus. And that Jesus had developed from the Serapis cult. And Serapis cult developed from the Asarian cult. So you see where the savior concept comes from. It's just a concept. Jesus never lived. The calendar's all backdated and retroacted to try to create that character for the first century. The early founding Umayyah knew that there was no Jesus 2,000 years ago. They didn't write about no Paul. If the New Testament is the NGO, they didn't write about Paul and all the others. They didn't write about any of that. That's the secret of the Knights nice Templar. That's the secret of the history of Islam is that Isa, Iashu, and his mother, Maryam, Maryam Hetshetsu, were Egyptians. That is the secret. And the lineage was given to her because her bloodline was the bloodline that's tied to the Pharaoh. That's why it's Isa ibn Maryam and not the vizier who came to her who helped conceive the child. The early Muslims knew that. The Muslims now, they believe that Torah means the Old Testament, Injil means the New Testament, Bible came before the Quran. They believe all of the, the inaccurate statements, and they believe that it's 2023 or whatever calendar that the Muslims are using that has a 354-day calendar. They believe all of that. They have no idea about the reality of history. So these dates here are telling you where this stuff comes from. You see the J after 1524 is being used. The era of Jesus, 548. When Scaliger came, they made these dates into 1548 and backdated the Jesus to 2,000 years ago and developed into a uh, character. This is why when you read the lessons, when they ask what is the birth record of others in Islam, it says uh, Buddhism is 35,000 years old and Christianity is 551 years old. It dates it back to the translation of the Bible into English for the first time. They had a new character now. This new Christianity that you're seeing on the earth, that's less than a thousand years old. The prior Christianity was a mythical Eosis savior that developed from the Serapis cult. Serapis cult was a cult 
the Greco-Romans developed from the Asarian cult. The Asarian cult is old. Pyramid takes old. There was no Jesus. The Muhammad that you know of in history was fake. There's no one on earth who can argue with me with these points. And if these points that I'm arguing tonight are in fact actual fact, then it is true not only that the white men, there are white men who wrote the Bible, but the Bible is not from God. And you are following it as it is from God and it's not. You don't know God until you know nature. After you learn nature, you can speak to God. Not Moses through a burning bush. Not Muhammad on Mount Hera, which is actually a Baghdadi uh, Christian city from that time. None of that. I'm talking in the space between your ears. See, if you get good, the plants will talk back to you and tell you what's in them or you need to use them. George Washington Carver was not lying. So y'all going to have to go back and do history all over again. I don't care what you believe in history. You have to get primary documents and go over this. And for, for the people who, 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 who are saying that I'm reaching for the meteor, you go look at conventional history and it, show, it tells you it, show you, it will show you the exact crater site for the main meteor that created what we know of as the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> this is not something I'm making up. I'm bringing in the aspects of uh, Stone Mountain and Arabia Mountain, but I have my scientific reasons and stuff I've collected and doing tests on right now from third parties to verify what I'm, I'm saying. But that's a moot point. It doesn't matter. If that point is not accurate, it has nothing to do with the conversation that we're having right now. And that's okay. You know, people are going to feel the way they want to feel and emote the way they want to emote. But the Bible is full of lies. It's the Sorcerer's Guide to how to manipulate it has low-level magic in it. And uh, this is what you're following because you believe that it's divine. And that's okay. That's okay. You have a right to stay in whatever feelings and belief that you want to stay in. And we'll leave you there. Get the book. I'm not going to be presenting on these uh, historical topics over and over again. I've written enough literature now. We have all of the details that we have need. Uh, the volume two will be out in the fall. And y'all can read on that for the people who are into that. All right. Uh, Level of scholasticism. But this one right here. This is number 33 right here. A dagger. The Bible was written by white men. White men who were very racist, very misogynistic. And it has nothing to do with salvation for indigenous peoples on this planet at all. That is my presentation to you. You can read over this book, critique this book, share information in this book but more importantly you can afford this book because until 11 59 at night it will be there for 30 dollars for you to get if you would like the material all right i will put the link in the description of this video as well after we get off of here and i'm done my conversation in the future will be uh, directed towards STEM, as always. I'm into the science, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics, the things that are civilization building, um, and the character and more, de more development. I'm into all of that. I'm not into beliefs and spookism that hold people back and hold potential back. Nothing wrong with talking about history. Nothing wrong with talking about religion. Nothing wrong with talking about politics. But Let's make it a functional discussion. We can get back to summits, think tanks, and all of the stuff that we usually do. Matter of fact, we'll be in think tanks this week. 
getting back to our normal uh, functional problem solving operations. This was a big problem solver, a huge one. The link is there. I will put it in the description of this video and save it there for the night. If you want hard copies, um, you know, you can go to another website to get the hard copies. Yeah, I'll give you that. If you want a hard copy, you can go to our government page and you can get a hard copy. If you want a hard copy full color, do that as well. Keep that in your library. This is a hard copy. I'm posting it to the link. Yep. All right. So we're done, family. Hopefully this video helps you out. It gives you some model to study. If you get the book, you're going to solve all the problems with setting up your chronology and understanding what time it is. It's 15,109 on the original calendar. If you chart the calendar by the stars, y'all not about to get no white folks that can pull these stars up out of space. And stop us from being able to operate based on science and mathematics and advanced uh, technologies and advanced levels of thinking that we have been doing since we've been here. Sorry. So there's one book that cannot be destroyed it is the book of nature. Y'all can write all y'all can follow all the other books that y'all want. That's the only one that God authored. So we are done. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Happy Father's Day to all of the fathers out there who are standing up and being men in their community. We need it more. Um, we need a, a greater understanding of what fatherhood actually is. And um, yeah, keep problem solving and thinking community over self and over other things. If you think community, you operate community, you operate in the family, you are going to be successful. You're following the design of nature. You will not lose. You will have cooperation, you will have teamwork, you will have good planning, you will have success, you will have happiness, and you can put that on repeat for the rest of your life. But you have to figure out why you're here. You have to work at designing your purpose, diversifying your purpose, and monetizing your purpose. Yes, you have to monetize it. But monetize is only energy in action, which we call currency. And we control that. All right. So we out.